Hello, I'm Simon Calder, this is Back to the City, and for today's episode, I'm very excited to be joined by my good friend, Courtney Yasmini. Hello, hello, Simon. I'm hello. so glad to be here with you. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're <laughs> here with me now and that you were with us in the Minnehaha Recording Company for mm -hmm. a session last night. Mm -hmm. uh, so last night you came in and you played three songs from your newest record, which was two years in the making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. Rob, who not only plays drums on it, but plays mm -hmm. uh, some of the bass. Yeah, and uh, even everything, a little bit of everything yeah. on, the, on the record. Yeah. And, uh, and then sings some of the backup with some other uh, gospel singers on yes. the record too. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward <laughs> to talking about the gospel component good, of the good, record. Good. So Rob, who will be playing drums with you in the session that we'll be witnessing in a moment, yeah, yeah. Um, who produced the record and plays lots of the instrumentation on the record. It's one of the records that he's produced that he's most proud of. It's yeah. your best record, you believe? I believe it is. I think it's my best record so far. So far. Yeah, yeah. I think so. And maybe even by leaps and bounds, but mm. certainly, yeah. I think it's, you know, my best achievement. Momentarily, we'll be at the Minnehaha Recording Company for cool. what you're thinking of as your th as the theme song. Yeah. Is the your theme, theme song? My, or the theme, theme, your my theme song. Theme song. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah. A song called Remedy. A song called Remedy. Fear is my enemy. Money is my rival. Mm -hmm. Gratitude is the remedy. And love is my survival. That's kind of the tagline. Yes. Yeah. Something else that we'll talk about as well mm -hmm. as the record yeah, is, is the first novel in a series of four yeah. that you're putting in. Yeah. These began as a memoir. Mm -hmm. um, it was so a big giant yeah. memoir. Yeah. Inspired by your life, yeah. obviously. Um, but it has been translated into fiction and this, you're working on uh, getting the second novel f in the series The second series of one is finished. written, yeah. uh, but it's a little too long. Mm. And so um, I'm editing it myself mm. before I pass it along to this same publisher. We have a four book arrangement, sure. but we both feel that the first, this second manuscript is, is running long. Mm. So I'm trying to get it tighter. This was uh, the story of Sydney's one year uh, running away from home and living in the cabin alone, which is what I did. Yep. And it worked really great to be very short and mm -hmm. very concise because it's one year <clears throat> yeah it's one winter and it and it's it's an it that was an achievement for me to get it like that to have it be a fictional character so that it's uh it's really like pure entertainment value to me this way mm. and not like uh, like me venting mm. about my miserable childhood, which I, I didn't, I wanted to sidestep that and okay. just do something that... You thought that was a risk? I thought it was, well, the, the memoir was like that sure. for me. Yeah. It was like, you know, I, like it was like I started with the book of Genesis and I wrote the Bible of Courtney's tragic life or something. And I didn't want, I didn't want to publish anything like that. And mm. even though I even had offers to publish that memoir oh really the yeah. giant memoir <laughs> yeah but i turned that down uh into the process realizing that it would probably affect the way i felt about myself in the world and the way maybe the world felt about me for the mm. rest of my life mm. and uh i like being this person better a person who has taken yes my experience but made it into something that's more like, to me, more Jack Kerouac on the road, sort of adventure. Sure. Um, I like that. I like that that's what I put out into the world instead. Yeah. yeah. You had uh, one of your mentors uh, was Carol Bly, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. um, your creative writing mentor. And you shared the initial memoir version with, with Carol, is, it, yes. is that correct? Yes, true. And what was, what was Carol's advice? Um, Carol really liked it and Carol liked my writing style. She actually, I met her when I was applying for the MFA program mm. at the school where she was the head of the MFA program. Mm -hmm. And she took me aside and she said, you know, I don't think this is the right avenue for you and your work. Mm. Um, that the MFA program yeah. wasn't the right avenue that she ran? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, this is truth, you know. Yeah. Uh, she said, I was already a woman in my late 30s, and uh, she said, you have a great style, 
I think the things that you'd be trying to get out of this, um, I don't think you'll get them out of this. Mm. I think you'd do better to just really start taking your own writing seriously and make it happen, yeah. make, get it published. Sure. So then she and I worked on, I mean, I already had a behemoth of a manuscript, you know? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like I needed like motivation and she didn't mm -hmm. feel that I really needed to hone my writing skills that much. Mm -hmm. I had already been an English major, creative writing student in college. Sure. Um, I had taught high school English. I mean, so I, you know, I, I had my first language mastered <laughs> <laughs> yeah. fairly well. Yeah, writing skill. Yeah, good, good writing skill. In my, yeah. in my like, birth language, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, yeah, I had that down. So um, it was just a matter of her really getting into the manuscript with me. And she got really excited about it because she loved the memoir form. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the memoir form, especially for women, was very popular in the literary scene. Sure. To publish memoirs was sort of hip right then. So when was then? Uh, so that was like 15 years ago. Okay. So you had a memoir fully written 15 years ago uh -huh. and uh -huh. then decided how recently to turn it into four Um years. Well, so then uh, I, I got a call from a friend who had been at a cocktail party mm -hmm. in New York City. Mm -hmm. I was in Minneapolis at the time. She had been at a literary cocktail party and she said that she had met someone at the party who was talking about uh, how she wanted, and in her own small press, to focus on um, songwriters and musicians who were out in the world playing performances and touring and doing things like that, who hmm. also had manuscripts that they wanted to publish. This because she was just, looking for you. I'm not kidding. Yeah. <laughs> and this other Have woman. Have seen a Courtney anywhere? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? I'm looking for a Courtney. Right. <laughs> and so this woman called me the next day and she said, I, do you have a manuscript? Because I told this woman, I think you might have a manuscript and you might be just what she's looking for. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, but I decided 10 years ago that I wasn't going to publish that manuscript. <clears throat> so I sort of, you know, I was very flattered. I was delighted that they were talking about me. But I was like, well, I mean, I have a manuscript, but I don't have a manuscript for you guys, mm. you know. Mm. So this publisher got in touch with me. And she said, you know, we'd like to have your manuscript. And I said, okay, well, I'll write one for you. I'll write what I always thought it should have been. Right. You and, fiction, fictionalized. Yeah. And she said, well, you know, how quickly could you get it to us? And I was like, well, how quickly do I need to get it to you? And she said, well, it'd be great if we could have it in six weeks. And I just said, great. So you wrote and this in six weeks? knocked that out in six weeks. <laughs> it's a, I, I knocked it out. It doesn't read out. like it was re written in six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it was, you know, I, I've been thinking of this story all right. my life, right? And, I, and I've and i been thinking about it being a fictional character. And I mean, I've been gearing up for those six weeks for a long time. Right. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you had the manuscript that you were translating into fiction. So yeah. And I didn't, I didn't actually look form. at that manuscript at all, but I didn't mm -hmm. need to. Because that, like I said, that well, I wanted it to turn into a four book series sure. of these, you know, these phases of this songwriter's life. So I just, I just knew, I know how it goes. I know how it goes now, mm. you know. So before we dive into and take our journey <laughs> through the record, mm -hmm. uh, let's focus a little bit more on the novel, which okay. then we can sure, leave sure. the the listeners, the viewers, to, to go and purchase and read, yes. read for themselves. Yes. Yes. So not only are you writing four novels, but you're writing daily blog posts for your website too. Yeah, and there's it's a new thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a great <laughs> thing. They're, they're, I recommend checking those. If you have time to read a novel, then read a daily blog post. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them is about Carol Bly, who we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. The advice from Carol that you relay in the April 17th blog post had to do with the importance of the character of the writer for good writing. She theorized in an, in an essay that there are four yeah. stages of character development yeah. that seem important, I think, both for maybe the four novels, but then also mm -hmm. for the narrative of the character within the record. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the four, can you mm -hmm. uh, remind us of what them. these four stages are? So the one is the love of beauty. Yep. It's sort of like, if you at least have that, you are elevated from, as a human being, you're elevated like from squalor. Mm by your love of beauty. And Edith Wharton talked about this very thing, about mm. how if your surroundings are beautiful, 
And if you care about beauty, mm -hmm. you sort of elevate the, the everyone in the space. Hmm. People sort of act better. Hmm. Okay, so that's sort of the, the basic thing. So yeah, what happened according to Carol Blay? What happens next? Yeah, then then what? Ideally, you'd get you'd get over that and you'd get past that because that can make you you know sort of a superficial person. Mm -hmm. um, you'd get beyond that by having a love of justice, mm -hmm. where you know you you don't tolerate tyrannical parents or authority figures or you know in, injustice. So mm -hmm. so you'd have you'd cultivate in yourself like no, it's just not right the way. This is, and I'm, you know, I'm going to stand up for justice. Um, and then the third one is that you would start to sort of evolve into thinking about these things consciously. Mm -hmm. the, the other, those two things could, the beauty and the justice could be almost like knee-jerk reaction things mm -hmm. that you haven't really thought through. Like this is unjust, you know. Yeah, you would just go, my God, that guy just, slap that other person in the face and I'm going to go over there and say you can't just slap that person in the face you sure. know yeah. and you would just do it yeah um, so the third level would be um, that you would evolve uh, consciously to saying I'm going to have my own code of personal principles we could talk about that for the rest of the day absolutely yeah. <laughs> um, we will in a sense okay it will good. come up through discussing okay, the good. Yeah. and then the fourth um, which I've always thought was a very beautiful thing and I will tell you, audience and Simon, that I have used this fourth one hmm. sometimes in my own mind to make my own judgments about other people's characters. Hmm. So hmm. it's a handy dandy one to know. Okay, what's the secret? So the what fourth is one <laughs> is We're to uh, be willing and able to sacrifice these principles that you've honed and that you hold so dear to sacrifice these principles for the greater good. Hmm. It's like a, so that's a kind of higher way of thinking about justice in, in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've that's thought about it many times saying, is it true? Is it real? What does it mean? Hmm. And I've applied uh, scenarios of people I've known hmm. and you can apply it and it's, it's pretty interesting to watch uh, a person who's sort of you know, very stalwart in their principles, mm. and uh, they are so stubborn, let's say, mm. that they end up hurting everybody. Right, yes, exactly. A favorite novelist of mine is George Eliot. We've talked about George Eliot <laughs> before, but this, it makes me think of the kind of, you know, what that, what the depictions of life in the Eliot novels is, you know, I feel mm -hmm. like we can draw similar conclusions there that sometimes one's very kind of moralistic drive mm -hmm. can be the very thing that leads one to, you know, hurt other people. Sometimes. Well, the one that's the easiest one is thinking about uh, any family that would shun uh, their own teenage daughter for getting pregnant. Mm. It's a really good example. I mean, that goes against our principles. Yeah, yeah, like people who would, you know, just say, well, this, this, I mean, it's much more of a Victorian mentality that a teenage daughter was sent to like a home for unwed mothers uh, so that no one would see her. And then the baby was taken away and given up for adoption immediately. Hmm. Um, all of which, I mean, no matter what your viewpoints are on these things, the, everybody was hurt by, you know, everyone in the family would be hurt by that scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and that was based on everybody having these strong principles mm. that they just couldn't bend, yeah. you know? Yeah, so I think that this idea of there being initially an ascent from an appreciation of beauty through love of justice to constructing personal principles to being able to sacrifice one's personal principles for the greater good. Um, this provides an interesting framework, I think, to talk about both the novel and the record, because I think that both of them are really grappling with some important ethical and spiritual and social issues. Um, you say in, the, in, the, in your blog post uh, that something to aspire to is to be able to live by all four, which I think is a slightly different emphasis than desiring to ascend from one to four. Uh, to enjoy a love of beauty, to defend your love of justice, to live by your own code of principles, and to be prepared to sacrifice those principles for the greater good. 
I will endeavour to live by all four Ukrainians. So um, <laughs> let's look at, I've isolated just a couple of passages from the first novel, A Girl Called Sydney, <laughs> um, so that we can give the viewers a little preview. We're going to zoom in on two moments in the okay, life fun. Of, of, of Sydney. And, and in Simon's British accent. <laughs> and very, <laughs> right. very fun for the author <laughs> to get to hear that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and we can think about Sydney through the lens of these four stages of development, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. this is a product of a writer who's thinking about the importance of those four stages of development. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's a paragraph. I hated it when they tried to get me to join them. I would be sitting on the dock in the only bikini, swimming costume, we were talking mm -hmm. about swimming costume. Swimming costume. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I would be sitting on the dock in the only bikini I had, a sweatshirt of my brother's over it. My flute and my guitar were often laid out on a big quilt covering the wooden boards. I'd have my notebook and some songbooks and an issue of Seventeen magazine. My mother would have brought me, would have bought me the last time we went into town, went into town. Yes, yes. <laughs> I had my day mapped out with practicing, journal writing, songwriting, studying the construction of a famous artist's song. When it got really warm in the mid afternoon, I'd swim and work on my stuff some more. I had no goals. I had no dreams. I did not envision myself becoming anything except maybe more fashionable when I went back to school in the fall. I never thought about status clothes like my mother's. I thought about cutting my hair short again and maybe wearing a piece of leather tied around my neck with a few beads on it. I thought about wearing my hooded sweatshirt that was way too small, but pushing up the sleeves and wearing it super tight because it hit right at the bottom of my jeans and made my curvy figure look pretty nice. And then it continues. I recommend uh, reading the rest of the paragraph and the rest of the novel. Great. But um, I think that we catch the protagonist uh, at a certain moment, obviously, in, the, in their life. What are some pertinent features of, of this character as presented at that, of the snapshot that we have of this character? Oh, maybe you tell me, Simon. Mm. What do you think? Um, I think that it is the claim that they have no goals is interesting for following mm -hmm. the fact that they you know the goal for the day was to study the construction of a famous artist's song <laughs> I, feel, <laughs> I feel like if we are to place uh, mm -hmm. this character somewhere on this like ascent narrative as much as they claim that they you know their main aspiration is to Look cool. To look cool. <laughs> <laughs> to look the, cool. Yeah, which would suggest like yeah. being on level number one. Yeah, well, all right. So I guess I'm ready to say something about mm. that. I think that I um, have always been that person. Mm -hmm. I, didn't <clears throat> I, I didn't have a heart for uh, uh, trying to achieve um, worldly popularity mm -hmm. uh, through my project mm -hmm. and I didn't have like the stomach mm -hmm. for trying to monetize um, or make make into the business world my projects mm -hmm. I really have only forced myself to do that now at this How point recently uh, for about the past four years sure the period of time that we've known each other. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where I, you know, I ran out. Time ran out. Time ran out on. Uh, up until that point, uh, my children and I were all living together, and mm. we had child support mm -hmm. from their father, who was a doctor. So there was enough money mm -hmm. um, for us to run a household. Very great, but simply. Um, mm. But I knew that my time was coming. Mm. Um, I had done other kinds of work. During that time, part-time, different uh, sort of secondary art form work, mm -hmm. and it only was in these four years. These, when my son uh, left home and was on his own, my youngest mm -hmm. child, mm -hmm. that I said, "Okay, this is it. I either will go get a conventional job now because I need an income for myself, mm. or I will make all of this finally work for me." Yeah, the way I worked on it with. I, I did, truly. I mm -hmm. 
I love the pastime of laying out the quilt, have my flute, have my guitar, have mm. my notebook, mm. have my songwriting yeah. things. So like the Sydney in this passage. Play the song, think about it, wonder why is that song so good, mm. write out all the words, stare at it, think about is it just when this chord goes to this chord, how mm. does that seem so wonderful when they just are going from the C to the E minor, how could it be so wonderful right there? Right. Ponder these things, truly just for myself. Okay, so that's, so that's your MO, but it then is. you've more recently pushed yourself to think, mm -hmm. I, I can and therefore should make this my career, mm -hmm. like my full-time career. Yeah, I feel that it's the right thing to do to bring all of these uh, efforts like to fruition somehow. Mm. I feel that now it's like the last thing I have left to do with the time I have on this earth. Mm -hmm. It's like my uh, y using all the talents, you know, God given, mm. however you want to think about it. I feel obligated now to, I think for the sake of others as well, that you just, I think people need to believe that it's possible. Mm -hmm. And there need to be people who are willing to tough it out and ram it home, whatever you need to say, sure. to make it happen so that you can say, you see all this magical thinking can amount to something. Mm. Yeah, magical thinking again is what fiction enables. Mm -hmm. And the fiction, there is... And certainly a, songwriting. Yeah, there's short narratives. <laughs> there's a lot of narrative yeah. based Like songs. this lady with the flowers in her hair, the, her Frida Kahlo sort of vibe, and her Japanese guitar, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean... I, the high priestess? Is yes, this the high priestess. High priestess. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it is an actual photograph of me, and it's yeah. absurd, you know? It's utterly absurd, man, and I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most absurd that I we, have been publicly, and I love it. And we, we get <laughs> kind of three manifestations of Courtney today, because mm -hmm. if this is your kind of more casual right now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> than the high priestess and right. then at the at the recording company you'll be somewhere between the teeth yeah yeah that's probably right mm -hmm. and we'll get there momentarily um to begin our journey through the record but before that let's uh take another snapshot of sydney um and by this point sydney's brother preston is leaving for college dad seemed genuinely excited about the school he and Preston pointed out the beautiful buildings. That's interesting, pointing out beauty. Mm, mm -hmm. Stage one. Mm -hmm. um, old and picturesque. The campus looked like a really nice park with rolling grassy hills and pretty stone bridge over a brook. And a pretty stone bridge over a brook. For a minute, I wondered what it would be like to go to college. It seemed very free and very romantic. I thought about books and the kind of discussions Preston and I had had about Emil Zolder's story over the summer, and I realized I was going to miss my brother. I wondered if I'd ever go to college. For a fleeting second, I thought about how someone like Jay, who is a friend that she's made on the, when she wasn't on the jet skis yes. uh, in, that, in that previous context, yes. uh, for all of his good heartedness and innate dignity, was not really capable of that type of literary discuss discussion, not really capable of that type of literary discussion, and maybe never would be. And uh, I'll read a little bit more. Mum, Mum, Dad and Preston were carrying his things to the dorm. Jay and I had Brandy, who wasn't allowed inside. But Brandy is... The family dog. The family dog. Uh, we walked the campus and saw some very unusual looking characters. There was a girl in a long embroidered dress and heavy leather boots walking across the stone bridge, singing what sounded like an aria in Italian. Wow, that was freedom. There were kids who looked dirty and grimy with cigarettes and unusual hats, beads around <laughs> their necks, young men with long hair and scarves at their necks, girls with very long or very short hair, ethnic jewelry, flowering, gauzy clothes. I remarked that Preston was going to fit right in. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's her impression of this new context that her brother is leaving for. And I feel like, is there some kind of transition happening at that moment, what do you think of your character, in both senses of the word, your character, I suppose, mm -hmm, yeah, um, yeah. Ca like that snapshot of your character as presented by you in this novel? Uh, I think that there's a, there's a tension 
um, between the very primal um, ideas of playing a six string wooden guitar mm. and writing words like an old, like a bard, like an old troubadour, um, like Woody Guthrie, um, Bob Dylan didn't, didn't end up going to college. Um, and yet Bob Dylan has the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. for literature. Yeah, as does Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, as does <laughs> yeah. Kendrick, right? Yeah, excellent. Um, so there's this tension in my mind mm -hmm. uh, about the academic world and the um, very uh, high um, literary mind. Um, Mighty. It, and the freedom uh, to be an intellectual mm. and uh, and yet um, let's think about Bob Dylan again he loved Allen Ginsberg but he also loved Woody Guthrie mm -hmm. I think those two people would represent sort of like I again these sort of two almost like to, in my head like sort of these things were sort of polarized that Two the, different exemplars. The guy, Jay, and the, the character mm -hmm. in that passage is a guy whose parents are um, uh, they're in the Iron Range and in northern Minnesota, and mm -hmm. uh, the father works in the mines doing manual labor, and Jay has followed in his footsteps doing manual labor, not going to college. But this young man, Jay, plays a 12-string gu guitar really great, mm -hmm. And Sydney is uh, able to sing a lot of songs with him, and she really it has loves this real that. bond and connection. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's uh, I now I'll just say about myself. I have all my life I have found it to be sort of um, a little bit confusing um, that when I hear someone play that well mm. and musically, I always assume that that person is everything that I romantically want them to be. Like they're brilliant and they're nice mm. and they're they're a great conversationalist mm. and they're they're everything of the all four <laughs> <They've got everything laughs> levels. <laughs> and, As demonstrated and by and the guitar. Quite frankly, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I've known a lot section. of guitar players in my life and a lot of them are not that. A lot of mm. a lot of people who can play the guitar really well only can play the guitar really well. <laughs> <laughs> End of story. <laughs> Sorry to say, but that's yeah. I have I have found that to be true. So then, then in my mind, it's like wow. So you can have these skills that are beautiful and mm. and evoke beauty mm. and evoke a lot of emotion and imagination and make my brain really go. Mm. But but maybe for that person who's who's creating that, they maybe are creating it only on the level of like making the good music. Right. Unlike on this record, mm -hmm. I think it's the best music that you and Rob have made together. Oh, good. But I think it certainly is that. But then also mm -hmm. I feel that there is this heightened um, consideration of something like the relationship between those four different you know, po positive attributes of character. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of other mm -hmm. important philosophical, spiritual mm -hmm. rumination going on too. Good. <laughs> Thank <laughs> so, God Simon feels that way. <laughs> so let's see if we can like demonstrate or pers demonstrate to or persuade mm -hmm. the viewers that that's, okay. that's what's okay. happening. So we're going to take our transition to from the novel to the record via the first of three live performances at the Mini Haha Recording Company. Cool. Here's Courtney Yasmine uh, with Rob uh, performing the theme song. Remedy. Remedy, yeah. This is Remedy at the Minnie Haha Recording Company.
only want more I knew a man with money to burn He couldn't sleep at night He would toss and turn Worried over the great unknown What if the roof falls in and the sky falls What if I lose my wife, my kids, my house, my job, my life, my soul Like a baby every night, so sound Does good work, thinks good thoughts Says good words, says it's all gonna work out He's now worried over the great unknown What if the roof falls in and the sky falls What if I lose my wife, my kids, my house, my drive, my hike, my soul As you highlighted, fear is my enemy and money is my rival. Gratitude is the remedy and love is my survival. Hold me up, hold me high, don't let me fall. And the music that we can hear in the background right now is the opening track from the record, the tower card. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the idea of ascent uh, and descent uh, mm -hmm. is crucial throughout the record. Mm -hmm. The interplay of it. So there's mm -hmm. this positive descent that one experiences mm -hmm. through the ta through falling yeah. from the tower. What is? It's super weird. I'm I'm excited that you're talking about this because I thought about it so much. I would think about these songs and I would think, God, they all have up and down. this weird up and down. They yeah. have this weird like she's like always obsessed with falling. Oh my God, we have to hear that she's like worried <laughs> she's gonna fall again. Then she and has to say. That you've got to fall. Let yourself fall. Yeah. And then, then the other time she's saying, please don't, please don't let me fall. And she's yep. praying that she's not going to fall. Oh, my God. Yep. Right? And, and then at other times, um, she thought that she was up, but she was actually down on in the broken. I had it buried so deep I couldn't feel it. It's so damp again. Like, mm -hmm. It's you know, the metaphor of being low. Um, I said I was on the top, but I was on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So... And I think that this is, I think, like in a good novel, the fact that there are these different ways of thinking about height and depth and ascent and descent and the virtues of either. Okay, um, I have to interject this yeah. right here. This, for me, this is a great life moment to get to interject this. And this is the kind of thing that only could I do this with Simon Calder in this type of an interview situation. But when my first child was a little mm. baby mm -hmm. nina who is nina. now nina luna a songwriter yeah nina my first baby when she just learned to talk okay she'd be in her car seat we lived in vermont at the time mm -hmm. were a lot of rolling hills mm -hmm. and the Up highways and between the towns really go like this so that sometimes the the highway that's two lanes going up yeah. is crossing over the, the highway that's two lanes going down and it's it, they're going like this kind mm. of. Yeah, you wow. have to go to Vermont and sort of see what we mean. But little Here's Nina a aid. <laughs> little Nina would sit in her car seat and as we were driving along, she's maybe like very young, very little kid, she would say she'd be looking out the window and she'd say, Now we're up and the other people are down. Now we're down and the other people are up. Now we're up and the other people are down. <laughs> she would just keep commenting on that. Yeah. And I honestly, I thought about that when I was making this record, that it was like somehow Nina foreshadowed the whole thing. <laughs> so she was like trying to reveal something of great yeah. spiritual significance. Yeah. So listen, Mum. <laughs> yeah. Like now we're up and the other people are down, but now we're down and the other people yes. are up. Think about yes. it. <laughs> Ruminate. Exactly. <laughs> My God, she's on to something. Yeah. And uh, not only was uh, Nina, your daughter, onto something, but 
um, the tarot, the fortune teller, mm-hmm. who the, the, that's the, the first lyric in the, on the mm-hmm. record is fortune teller down in New Orleans, mm-hmm. uh, drew a and tower card. Let me just that say means? that the, the fortune teller is in the music video that we made called Misfits and Losers. Oh. We filmed it in New Orleans. Yeah. And we actually hired this fortune teller on the street to do my fortune while we were making the music video so it could be in the video. This music video, which and is just And this is the man who said this to me. Wow. And that was the last record, was Misfits and Losers yes. was on that last record, Make Wake Me Up When It's Over. Yes. And then that's how it goes perfectly in, because we, th- we were making it uh, just yeah. kind of w- cool. I think we, did we meet at the record release? Was mm-hmm. The record release was at Bunkers, I think. Is that mm-hmm. right? For yeah. Wake Me Up When It's Over. Yeah, exactly. so that's where we met. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, okay, so you're making the music video, then you get your fortune made you know, for this scene in the music video and you're presented with the tower card. You know what that means is a lyric. For people who don't know what that means, what does that mean? What's it mean to be granted the tower, the tower card? card yeah. Means Ominous. that the it shows the tower and it shows the people falling out of it and like an explosion of fire at the top. We have a lyrics video right now on mm. YouTube mm-hmm. of tower card Mm -hmm. and it's the tower card from the tarot deck is animated Mm. so that people keep falling (laughs) and the flames keep coming up so that's the indication is that there is uh that you're going to have beware doll you're bound to fall you know when the tower card comes out it's like there's going to be some kind of like a reckoning okay you will find yourself you are the kind of person who will find themselves in this Scene. Turmoil mm. inducing scene. It's like at the rate you're going, mm. something bad is bound to happen. Mm. Did you realize in the mu- when the music video was being filmed yep. that that was an important revelation yep. uh, that would play an important role in yep. the next record? Yeah, and yep. I knew when the guy said it, I said, I know. And the guy said, Well, I'm worried about you. And this young man who was the fortune teller who was mm. a street person yeah he and i have stayed in touch on facebook ah, okay <laughs> so so is so what he says when he says he's worried about you is is it beware doll you're bound to fall mm-hmm. or did he elaborate yeah because the other cards all indicated that i was sort of i was sort of setting myself up for disaster mm. And he was saying, like, are you aware of this? Like, are you are you having problems with like money? And are you hmm. are you unsure about how to go forward? And are you? And I was like, yeah, man, are you kidding me? Of and course. here we were down in New Orleans, blowing money on this music video yep, that I him, money I didn't him. have, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> but we were determined to make this. It was all very mystical about why New Orleans. I had had this dream about playing in New Orleans. Yeah. I felt I had to go down there, you know, damn the torpedoes. We were going, yeah. we were down there. And then this, here's this fortune teller who says, you know, lady, are you aware that you are headed for trouble? And I was like, no kidding. He was Sick. saying, it's very obvious to me that these card, this card reading is showing that you're headed for a, 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 rec- a day of reckoning is coming mm. for you. And we were, I was saying, yes, I know that this is coming and I can't stop it. Mm. And he was just, he was just sort of in agreement. He was like, you know, batten down the hatches because you're headed for disaster. So then the t- <laughs> uh, do the two of you concur then in thinking that you need to take time to let your body fall. This is going to happen to Courtney. Exactly. You should embrace it. Exactly. Okay. Take time, take time to let your body fall. Dancing in time till your heart initially and then later eyes are in line with the ceiling. What kind of, so that seems like maybe you and or you and the fortune teller are advising, well, what now? How am I going to, what does batten down the hatches mean for mm-hmm. me in, in, this, in this context? It's interesting mm-hmm. that the metaphor, like music immediately is turned to, the idea of dancing. Mm-hmm. Dancing mm-hmm. a line s- until your eyes, and then there's the metaphor of height, are in line with the ceiling. That's a really intriguing lyric, I think. 
Um, to me, it's like two things. It's like the ve very weird things. One, from my childhood watching the movie, musical movie of Mary Poppins, mm. and they go to visit this uncle and they float up into his ceiling of his old house. Sure. And it's the most magical part of that. It's one of the most magical parts. Yeah. Um, for the children. It's like they trip out with their weird uncle. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like that, <laughs> come to think of it, yeah. <laughs> and I've always been a very controlled person and I've been a very f afraid of being out of control. Yeah. So part of it is like, you know, be like the kids in Mary Poppins and trip out with your weird uncle and just like float up to the ceiling, you know? So part of it is uh, lose some inhibition and mm. fear of uh, losing control. Mm -hmm. Forget about that. It's too late for that. Right. Um, and the other part of it is the glass ceiling mm. of um, what was possible for a woman my age, what was possible mm. for anybody to become, uh, you know, you harbor these ideas like, what I really want to be is an international superstar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you have to sort of get up to wherever that ceiling is, you mm. know. And to some extent, by just falling back on being uh, the person that one is and doing what one was doing when one didn't think one had any plans. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, just dancing and writing and mm -hmm. becoming, like actualizing oneself. I think that's the thing. I think that's the thing. Yeah. I think it's just the darn truth. Right. And there's all kinds of like sensible advice. So no, that's, you know, you better instead of batting down the hatches, here's a sensible thing that you could do to just have a, a less eventful, <laughs> less risky life, but that yeah. isn't right. You'll avoid the failures, mm -hmm. but there's almost no chance of successes either then. You'll just be sort of in the mid-ground. Yeah. And the mid-ground was always very possible for me because I had my teaching license to teach high school English in the state of Minnesota. <laughs> so the mid-ground has been there. Yeah. Should All you want along. to hang out, hang out there? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the record begins with recognizing something about oneself and deciding to embrace that when you're going to realize you don't need to compromise. Um, mm. So that's interesting. There's this predicament, there might be some kind of crisis, mm -hmm. but the way to respond to that is not to compromise, it's to become more fully oneself and to and to thrive yeah let's just say the creative urges I've had inside of me I would like to bring those to fruition and if I choose a conventional uh, more comfortable safer path I won't have the energy or the time hmm. to do those things absolutely yeah so there is it seems like you know, the idea of like a trust fall here I could try to control things by using the credentials that I've developed or I could allow myself to fall as the person that I am and trust that good will come of that. I had a similar conversation with Hannah von der Hoff. Do you, mm -hmm. Are you familiar with Hannah yes, von der Hoff? Yes, she, I love Hannah. Yeah, me too. So, brief version of this story is that she posted to say that she was doing a trust fall with the universe. She was flying somewhere other than she was intending to. I went to a literature conference, which happened to be in Florida, which happened to be where Hannah had flown to. And as I arrived in Florida for the conference, I ran into Hannah at the airport, about to return to Minneapolis. And, uh, and then she came in and all of her songs uh, mm. about the trust fall mm. and about self-actualization. Mm. And uh, so that just seemed to be That's an amazing that's a, story. Yeah, and that's a, that seems to be the theme of, yes. of this season. Yes, that's an amazing story, and that's what we're looking for, I think, mm. are those times when the expression that I've been using is when the universe rises up to meet you in your pursuit yeah. of your destiny. Yeah. And that's what you're really looking for, I think. You're looking for, I mean, if we really want to get magical about it, what you're watching for is these signs that you, you maybe are doing the right thing because you you can start to see the universe rising up to meet you. Yeah. Co-conspiring.